Today, we're going to look how the wisdom of God is contingent on, I'll be right back with that answer, restoring the preeminence of Jesus Christ in business starts right now. Hello, I'm Lee Ray Heine, and thank you for watching. Four weeks ago, we started a series on the wisdom of God. And last week, we learned a little bit about um, uh, how to position yourself to receive the wisdom. We learned that the wisdom of God is always, always pertaining to Jesus Christ. And I closed last week's episode with a really bold statement to you, telling you that if your life, your career, your business didn't pertain to Jesus Christ, then don't expect to get the wisdom of God for them. And today we're going to continue on in that. And today I'm going to share with you another contingency. And to do that, I'm going to start off with reading Matthew 6.33, very popular, well-known verse. And it says this, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Well, if you remember that story, the disciples were concerned about their provision and what they would wear, what they would eat, and da-da-da-da-da, right? And the Lord is saying, hey, don't worry about those things. I know what your needs are before you ask. First seek my kingdom. First seek my righteousness. And all of those things will be added. Well, when he says all, the, all things, says here, and all these things shall be added, this is a, uh, a spiritual principle, Right? If you are looking for the things of God, if you're looking for the things that are pertaining to your life in Christ, then you must first seek his righteousness and you must first seek his kingdom and then those things will be added to you. So what I present to you in all things, wisdom is one of those all things that will be added to you if you will first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, meaning Jesus Christ. Now, I have dealt with this kingdom aspect, right? What is the kingdom? And if you've been with us now for the last seven or eight months, you know that um, I dealt with the kingdom. So I'm not going to deal with the kingdom here today because I've already done that. And in fact, if you have the book, Restoring the Preeminence of Christ in Business, you can find the lesson on page 46. And I think I covered it about three months ago right here on TV. Okay, so today what I want to do is I want to look at this righteous side of this verse. First seek his righteousness. Now, um, if you also, another word to use instead of contingent is a prerequis or, um, yeah, prerequisite, right? So first seek his righteousness and all these things would be added. So that's a prerequisite to have all things added to you, wisdom being included in all things. Let me share with you what the definition of, of prerequisite is and how it's defined in just the regular um, English dictionary. It says this, a thing that is required as a prior condition for something else to happen or to exist. Okay, so Jesus is saying, if you will first seek his righteousness, which is Jesus's righteousness, we're going to find out here in a moment, then all things pertaining to the kingdom will be added to you, and the wisdom of God is pertaining to the kingdom of heaven, okay? Now, before I dig into this um, lesson here today, I want to review our description of what an authentic disciple. As I've shared with you over the last three or four weeks now, that this whole episode um, and whole series on wisdom is added to this book, right? Restoring the preeminence of Jesus Christ in business, the ultimate unfair competitive advantage. This volume has been written for you to know really what is an authentic disciple, how to live as an authentic disciple. Now, this whole subject on wisdom is, is like volume two that gets attached to this book, right? I'm in the midst of studying and seeking the Lord on this subject and sharing with you what I'm learning here really each week and how the Lord wants me to... Um, Put it together as volume two in this book. So it's it, this whole subject on wisdom 
um, takes place after you've got the foundation here. Now, I'm going to refer to a lot of information today that refers to um, our description of what is an authentic disciple. So I want to review to you, review with you today, my description and our description at Windows of Heaven, what is an authentic disciple. Now, if you have the book, you can find that on page eight, or you can go back about seven months ago where we covered that um, when we first got started here on the Cross TV. Here's how we define an authentic disciple. An authentic disciple is a person who habitually lives a self-sacrificial life abiding in the living person of Jesus Christ. Those are some terms that we're going to look at here today and focus on out of this description. Abiding in, two important words here for today, and this phrase here, the living person of Jesus Christ. I continue on with the description saying this, baptized with power, a disciple lives an experiential lifestyle in communion with the Holy Spirit, manifesting mighty acts of love, faith, gifts, and signs, confirming that they are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Now, I have an asterisk next to communion, and I define that this way. Communion is a person's participation with the presence of the Holy Spirit as he manifests, that will be another key word that we look at today, the Spirit of Jesus Christ in their mortal flesh. So participation will be a key word and manifest will be a key word as we look at this um, lesson today on seeking His righteousness first, okay? Now, let's look at righteousness. And to do that, I'm going to start off reading Isaiah 53, 11. And it says this, He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear the iniquities. Isaiah 53, 11. Again, here's the Lord saying through the prophet Isaiah that Jesus Christ, his servant, is a righteous servant. So the Lord is calling Jesus here back in Isaiah the righteous servant of God. Now, let's jump over into the first uh, New Testament, and let's look at 1 John 2, 1. I'm reading to you out of the New King James Version. My little children, these things I write to you, so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Okay? So here in 1 John, we see the apostles say that Jesus Christ is the righteousness of God. And if you've studied the word at all, you know that Jesus Christ is the only righteousness of God. All right? Let's look at the opposite of, of uh, this righteousness being Jesus Christ. And let's look at um, Romans 3.10. I'm laying foundation here for where we're going today. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. Let me say it again. As it is written, none is righteous. No, not one. So righteousness is attained or accounted to an authentic disciple, not by works, but only through abiding in the living person of Jesus Christ by faith. Okay? So remember, we don't live unto ourselves. We live a life of a living sacrifice. It's no longer I who live, but it's Christ living in us by faith, and the communion of the Holy Spirit is our role of participating in the life of Christ by faith. And so if we're participating in the life of Christ, what we just read is Jesus is righteousness. We're participating in righteousness. We're participating when we're participating, manifesting Jesus Christ in our mortal flesh with the Holy Spirit. We're participating or practicing, you'll see here in a little bit, the righteousness of God, okay? So, no Christian will ever be able to achieve righteousness. It was never designed that way. You didn't receive the Holy Spirit so that you individually could become a righteous, upright, good-standing um, human being. That's not why you received the Holy Spirit. That's not, it's, not, it's not meant for you to become righteous. It's meant for you to abide in the righteousness of God and therefore be called the righteousness of God. So... Um, a disciple can never attain to righteousness of God outside of abiding in righteousness of God, which is Jesus Christ. Okay. Now, laying this foundation, now I want to go over and I want to talk a little bit about abiding, back into that abiding in the living person of Jesus Christ. 
back in that part of the description. Now, if you have the book, I just I um, covered the whole abiding aspect on page 11. And again, about six months ago here, so if you go over to our website, it'll lead you to our YouTube channel, and you can pick up and uh, go back about seven months and find the episode there on abiding um, at work in Christ, okay? So I want to share with you this abiding side and how what's taken place in business and how we don't operate with a consciousness of the living person of Jesus Christ. We don't live with a conscious reality that I've said in the past with us abiding in Christ, manifesting Christ, participating with Christ, and declaring the primacy of Christ over our business, doing all things heartily unto Christ, and doing all things in the name of Jesus Christ, as we covered last week. And so what's happened is, is we've taken Jesus Christ out of the Christian business community, right? We have replaced Jesus with terms like this, justice, ethics, excellence, value, leadership, and biblical principles. As I said to you, you didn't receive the Holy Spirit so that you could become a righteous or self-righteous individual, right? You received the Holy Spirit to abide in righteousness. You also didn't receive the power to apply biblical principles. Think about this. Jesus' presence, the Spirit, and His Word all abide in him, right? You weren't meant to receive this divine power so that you could manifest an individual um, component or um, attribute of Jesus Christ. You received the Holy Spirit so that you could bear witness of Christ. And guess what? His spirit, his presence, his word, his righteousness, his wisdom, his gifting is all one with him. They are never separated. You receive the Holy Spirit so that you could bear witness of Jesus Christ. And when you're bearing witness of him, you're bearing witness of perfect ethics, perfect integrity, excellence, perfect biblical principles, perfect spirit of God and gifting of God, right? So you receive the power to bear witness and be witness to Jesus Christ, and all of those attributes are one in him, okay? Let's talk more about this perfected person, Jesus Christ. I'm going to read to you out of Ephesians 4, 12 through 13, and we're going to focus on um, this word perfect, and I'm going to read to you again out of the Amplified if I didn't say that. His intention was the perfecting and the full equipping of the saints, his consecrated people, that they should do the work of the ministry towards building up Christ's body, the church, that it might develop until we all attain oneness in the faith and in the comprehension of the full and accurate knowledge of the Son of God, that we might arrive at a really mature manhood, the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Jesus or of Christ's own completeness found in him. Let me read that last part again at really mature manhood, the completeness of personality, which is nothing less than the standard height of Christ's own perfection, the measure of the stature of the fullness of the Christ, the completeness found in him. So you see, the perfection, the personality, and all of the attributes in their perfectness is found in Jesus Christ. So when you abide and you live in communion with perfection and you're manifesting Jesus Christ, you're manifesting, manifesting perfection, right? So remember, communion is a person, a disciple's participation with the Holy Spirit manifesting Jesus Christ in their mortal flesh. So when you're participating with the Holy Spirit manifesting Jesus Christ, you're participating manifesting perfect wisdom, perfect righteousness, perfect integrity, and most important, perfect love, the Son of God, right? The perfection of the Godhead in all of its fullness and in personality is found in Jesus Christ. That's why you receive the Holy Spirit, so that you would have the power to abide first in his righteousness and then have all these other things added to you. 
I want to share a story on, on, on self-righteousness with you. And to um, start that off, let me share with you Romans 10, 3 out of the New King James Version. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So I want to tell you about is a dear friend of mine owns a business, um, great man of God, and um, great Christian, great disciple, uh, great husband, um, um, a great community member of his local church, um, and has been a Christian for 30 plus years. Um, and in his business and in his industry, things have started changing again. And several years back, the Lord gave this CEO a prophetic word on the direction that he was going to lead the company and how he was basically creating a new wineskin. It was time to have the company reinvent itself to be so that it could succeed in the way that the industry was changing. Now, this was a longtime company, probably 30 plus years. It was, um, had gone through several ownerships and this man was now the new owner. Um, uh, he'd owned it for, for a while now as it's going through and becoming into this new wineskin. So he ran into a situation to where there were some employees, part of the company, part of the old wineskin that didn't fit. They were ready to retire, but a couple of them weren't really ready financially to retire. So this individual, this CEO, being an honorable man, um, was concerned about this, right? How do I let these people go? How are they going to provide for themselves? Is that really the right Christian thing to do? So I, I came to the CEO and trying to help him work through this, and I said, all right, do you really believe in this word that the Lord is leading and creating a new wineskin? Absolutely. We have got to move this direction. I said, so do these individuals fit that wineskin? Do, they, do you ever foresee them to be part of that wineskin? No, I don't, I don't. They just don't have the capacity. They're not really interested. Um, um, they're part of the old, old, um, old business. And I said, um, so do you believe that the Lord is leading you in this direction and it's time to um, remove these individuals? Yeah, but I just can't. How, how do I do this, right? And he's thinking of his own reputation and integrity and honor. It, it's all coming from the right heart, right? But here's what happens. He said he believed in the new wineskin. He believed in the way that the Lord was leading. He believed that Jesus was leading. Remember, the Holy Spirit doesn't speak or lead or guide on his own authority. He only takes that which he hears from Jesus, who all authority in heaven and earth has been given, for, especially as it pertains to his body. And this individual says, yes, I believe the Lord is doing this, but he couldn't for some reason get himself to let these people go. Now, letting people go wasn't an issue. He's done hundreds of, I don't know, hundreds of them, but tens of them over the years, right? So this wasn't the issue. But here's what this happened, and here's what's taken place, is his um, lack of understanding of his righteousness, Jesus's righteousness, he started exalting his righteousness, self-righteousness. So in this particular case, self-righteousness is being exalted over Jesus's righteousness. Now, here's, that's a good word for many of you right now because many of you do not understand his ways, right? He says, my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts, but we continue to try to reason the heavenly ways from our earthly ways. And in doing that, we are exalting what we believe is righteousness, which is then self-righteousness over participating in his righteousness, okay? So be very careful about doing that. Now, let's talk about practicing righteousness. And to do that, we're going to look at um, 1 John 3, 7. And it says this, Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he, meaning Jesus, is righteous, right? So we've just learned that Jesus is righteous. We're talking about practicing righteousness. The only way that you can do that, I've submitted to you, is to abide in the living person of Jesus Christ and participate with the Holy Spirit manifesting his righteousness, right, which comes through manifesting Jesus. So what I want to do is I want to share a few definitions with you today out of the complete word study dictionary of the New Testament on practice. And the first um, description I want to give you on practice out of this dictionary is this, expressing action either as completed or continued. I like the word completed, and I like the word continue, because manifested fits to that word completed, right? If I'm manifesting righteousness, I've completed that act of manifesting, participating with righteousness. It fits with our description. 
The other is, is continued. Well, we use the word habitual lifestyle, right? Meaning never ending, um, never ceasing, um, an ongoing lifestyle. Um, and so you see now why I read to you the description of what an authentic disciple is, because you can't participate in righteousness if you're not living as one, and you can't practice righteousness if you're not living as one. How about this one? Um, to behave in a certain manner, show a certain behavior or attribute that conducts uh, the, the conduct of oneself, right? The Lord says that you will know them by their fruits. So if you are participating with the Holy Spirit, practicing righteousness and you're practice, practicing, manifesting, bearing witness of Jesus Christ, and it will be a behavior and an attribute that will be visible to the rest of us. And then how about this last way? To make, cause, form, produce, bring about an external act as manifested in the production of something tangible, obvious to the senses. Yes, it uses the word manifested, right? Make known, um, obvious to the senses. We've described that to you um, in the past um, in doing that. So communion is a person's participation with the presence of the Holy Spirit as he manifests the Spirit of Jesus Christ in their mortal flesh. So what are you doing when you're practicing righteousness? You're manifesting, making known righteousness to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. You're making known and obvious to the senses of those in the world the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That's practicing, and you can only do that by abiding in the living person of Jesus Christ. So to summarize what I've been saying to you today, authentic disciples habitually live a state, practicing his righteousness through abiding in Jesus and manifesting Jesus. So if you aren't living as an authentic disciple, as I have described in this book, then you're not practicing righteousness. And if you're not practicing righteousness, which is a prerequisite to have wisdom or all other things added to you uh, that is pertaining to the kingdom, then you're also not attaining or participating in making known the wisdom of God. Because apart from this prerequisite, something that must take place first before wisdom is added to you. So that's why I shared with you today that wisdom is contingent on another one of these promises of first seeking the kingdom, first seeking his righteousness, practicing it, abiding in it, living as an authentic disciple, and then the wisdom of God, which pertains to Jesus Christ, will start to be progressively added to you as you grow in loving the Lord with all of your heart, might, soul, and strength. You're going to find out how much love is, um, is another prerequisite for abiding and manifesting and making known the wisdom of God. That's where we're going to end up. So, for those of you who are hearing this truth preached to you in this way for the first time, it can be very difficult, and I get that. But let me encourage you. Jesus Christ wants you living as an authentic disciple more than you want to be living as an authentic disciple. He wants you abiding and seeking his kingdom, and he wants to make known his kingdom. He wants you to participate in his righteousness more than you want it. And he certainly wants you to participate in making known the wisdom of God to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places as we started this off with more than you want it. So get engaged living as an authentic disciple. Get engaged loving the Lord with all of your heart, might, soul, and strength. Get engaged in practicing, abiding in the living person of Jesus Christ, manifesting his righteousness. And watch the wisdom of God start to be poured out on you so that you can make known that wisdom to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. So you've seen today that these prerequisites, right, these contingencies are, um, go all the way back to living as an authentic disciple. As I've described, I've given you the definition, I've given you the lifestyle, I've given you the, the supporting um, scriptures that back all of this up. All right, go over to our website, link over to Amazon, pick up this book, because here's your meditation exercise today. I want you to meditate on this description of what an authentic disciple is. And so let me read that to you one last time here today. Um, 
An authentic disciple is a person who habitually lives a self-sacrificial life, abiding in the living person of Jesus Christ. Baptized with power, a disciple lives an experiential lifestyle in communion with the Holy Spirit, manifesting mighty acts of love, faith, gifts, and signs, confirming that they are a disciple of Jesus Christ. Communion is a person's participation with the presence of the Holy Spirit as he manifests the Spirit of Jesus Christ in their mortal flesh. That's what I want you to meditate on. That's what I want you to journal next. Then I want you to write a belief statement on what your belief is in living as an authentic disciple so that you can start to receive and operate and manifest the wisdom of God. And then write that prayer request down. All right, let me pray for us. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your body. I thank you for your church. I thank you, Lord, for your word of God. Lord, you have given us everything in your word, as it says in Timothy, Lord, to instruct us, to correct us, to make us complete so that the woman and the man of God lacks absolutely nothing. Lord, you desire that your body would rise up and live as authentic disciples. You love and desire more for them to manifest and participate with you, manifesting your kingdom, your righteousness, and your wisdom, and your love on earth. I pray, Lord, that your people would become hungry. Lord, there would be a zeal in them, Lord, to live as this authentic disciple. Lord, that they would be hungry, Lord, manifesting Jesus Christ at their place of work. Lord, and I pray for your Holy Spirit to be upon them, Lord, so that they would do it with zeal, they would do it with humility, they would do it with love, and they do it decently and in order, respecting the authorities and that place of business. Give them wisdom, Lord, and give them favor in doing just that, Lord living as an authentic disciple, manifesting Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I look forward to seeing you next week.